coming out. I've, I've circulated the room, and Ventura County is well represented in this room. From every city, from Ojai to Santa Paula to right here in Camarillo to Oxnard, all of you are here. Thank you so very, very much. And I know all of you have busy lives, and you have family and friends, and the fact that you would come out uh, to this to express yourself uh, the commitment uh, many, many of you are making is, part, is quite extraordinary, and I am e extraordinarily grateful. We're going to be trying to get everybody into the room, so uh, we're not turning anybody away. So there might be a, a little bit of uh, moving around and movement uh, from the very beginning. But we are here tonight to talk about the Affordable Care Act and what may be proposed to repeal it and replace it. And I've heard from many of you about your experience with the Affordable Care Act. Some have told me how the Affordable Care Act has saved their lives. Some have complained that it's a little too complicated, a little too expensive. Uh, but no one has been without an opinion, that is for sure. <laughs> my respect to everyone, my response uh, to everyone has been, I know the law isn't perfect, I'm committed to improving it, and my ultimate goal, my ultimate goal is to have an affordable, quality health care system for each and every American. <laughs> threatened to repeal the Affordable Care Act and in one form or another replace it with something they say is better. President Trump recently said, quote, we will unleash something that's going to be terrific. <laughs> Believe me. Of course, uh, better and terrific are both in the eye of the beholder and will be defined in the details of actual legislation. Since winning the White House in both houses of Congress, I'm sorry to say, it would not be an understatement to say the Republicans are the proverbial dog that finally caught the bus it has been chasing for years. They are now confronted with having to define truly what is better and what does it better really mean, which is significantly more complicated than a half a decade of their just constant and persistent talking points. What we do know is that repeal and replace are two words being bandied about quite a bit. Whether we have repeal, delay, and replace, or what I would call the wing and a prayer plan, or we have repeal simultaneously with replace, or some combination of the two, there is no doubt that our nation's healthcare system will undergo significant change. And that is scary for all of us and, 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 and everyone really across the country. Whether you receive your healthcare through Medicare or Medicaid, your employer through the state exchanges, or you pay for it out of pocket on an as-needed basis, healthcare reform will impact you. I can guarantee that. So no matter what happens, we need to be careful. We do not want chaos. We want certainty. We want greater access, not less. We want more. We want more affordable, not less. And we want higher quality, not lower quality. President Trump and the Republicans in Congress claim they want to improve health care for all Americans. If that is the goal, then we agree. But if they have a plan to do that, I haven't heard of it yet. They've had more than, a, as I said earlier, half a decade to come up with one. I do not know that they, I do know that they have a proposed, they have some proposed old ideas and a set of principles that have been around for some time now and criticized for some time as wholly inadequate. In fact, a recent headline in the LA Times called their plan, quote, an attack on abortion rights and a handout to the rich, unquote. Yeah, yeah. We'll talk more about the various components of Speaker Ryan's proposal during this town hall, 
But in a nutshell, it includes block grilling and capping Medicaid funding to the states, health savings accounts that will benefit the wealthy, state-mandated high-risk pools that have proven not to work, buying across state lines, premium subsidies based on age but not on income, no guarantees for preventive care, maternity care, or mental health care, and yes, it will prohibit insurance plans from covering abortions, even when the coverage is paid for by the woman. These proposals, if this is the direction they go, would make health care more expensive for the vast majority of Americans, would reduce access for millions of Americans, and would lower the quality of health care for most Americans. But as I said, the Republicans are still trying to figure out how to proceed. Just in the last few weeks, pressure from the public, from all of you, has slowed the process down and forced the Republicans to take a step back. your voices are making a difference. There is still time to impact how they will proceed. I have brought three experts here today and two members of our own community who will tell you how health care impacts their lives and then I want to open it up uh, to you for questions. While I know that health care is very personal and there are very strong opinions, although it seems like this is a crowd that's all on the same page. I'm just asking everyone to be respectful of, of each opinion that might be stated in the room. And if you have any further questions or comments following the town hall, or if my staff can help you with casework, please write your comments or questions on the back of the agenda cards and leave them with my staff. We want to be ready and prepared to help you if we can. So with that, I'd like to introduce our panel. First is Abby Corsall, is a staff attorney with the National Health Law Program based in Los Angeles. The National Health Law Program is a nonprofit organization that works to protect and advance the health rights of millions of people. They're lawyers and po policy analysts work at the federal and state levels to provide all Americans with access to affordable quality health care. Abby is a tireless advocate and litigator with a special focus on low-income health programs including Medicaid managed care, Medicaid expansion, and basic health programs. Barry Zimmerman, many of you might know Barry. Barry is the director of the Ventura County Human Services Agency and will speak to what the ACA looks like right here in Ventura County. And finally, Nancy Gomez. Nancy is the organizing director of Health Access California, a statewide healthcare consumer advocacy coalition representing consumer groups, communities of color, immigrants, people with disabilities, women and children, and seniors, all with a common goal of ensuring quality, affordable health care for all Californians. Nancy is an integral part of the on-the-ground mobilization and advocacy efforts of the organization, and her cross-cultural perspective and experience is especially valuable in reducing health disparities and, dress, and addressing health equity and inclusion. So we will start right off the bat uh, with, with Abby, and I will pass the microphone on to you. Thank you. And thank you all for being here this evening. It's really wonderful to see um, so many people engaged in this issue. Stand I'm up. here. Stand all up. right. <laughs> Hi, is this better? <laughs> Great. So I'm here tonight to provide sort of a national perspective and a little bit of a historical perspective on why do we have the ACA and what is it meant and, and where we might go from here. Um, so I don't know how many of you remember back to you know 2009, 2010, um, but it, it was it was pretty tough times for people um, who didn't have access to health care through an employer 
um, or through Medicare or through some other means. Um, uh, uh, as of 2012, over 50 million Americans were uninsured, and that includes 70 million right here in California and about 130,000 here in Ventura County. Um, so that meant there were a lot of people who just didn't have access to health care, or, or when they needed health care services, they had to pay for those services completely out of pocket. Now, for others, um, even if they had health care, the cost was pretty high. Um, to buy coverage out of pocket, insurance companies could pretty much charge whatever they liked. There weren't a lot of cost controls. Um, and your out of pocket costs were also could be very high. So even if you had coverage, you might be paying thousands of dollars in co pays, co insurance, deductibles, and so on. Um, not only that, but the coverage was often pretty scanty. Um, there was no requirements in terms of the, the services that plans had to cover. So you could, for example, buy a plan that didn't include hospitalizations um, or maternity services. Um, and so you, if you had this coverage and you needed that service, you were still out of luck. And in addition, plans could uh, implement lifetime caps and limits on coverage, meaning they would only cover you up to a certain amount, and that if you needed more care, you were on your own. Um, I'll just give a personal anecdote. For me, I, I graduated from law school back in 2009, and I had about a two-month gap uh, between when I finished school and when I started my first job. Um, and I'm someone who has asthma. It's well controlled. I, I have an inhaler that I use when I need it, but otherwise I'm pretty healthy. Um, but I applied to buy some insurance for that little gap in time that I had, and I was rejected by three plans because I had a pre-existing condition, because I had asthma. Finally, I was able to buy a plan, um, but that plan said they would only cover me for everything except my asthma. They wouldn't provide me the coverage for the service that you know, I might actually need. Now, <laughs> in my case, I, I was only on the plan for a couple of months. It was fine. Um, luckily, I didn't have any kind of major issue during that time, but, but that was really the state of affairs back in 2009, um, that you really couldn't get the coverage that you needed often, and if you did, you had to pay quite a bit for it. Um, and just another uh, more professional anecdote, my first job out of law school that I then started in 2009 was um, really working here in California on our county safety net program. Um, so many of you may know there's a law here in California um, that says counties have to provide the basic health care services um, to their residents when they don't have them from another source. And back in those days, um, because Medi-Cal was limited only to people who fit in certain categories, like people who had a disability, someone who was a child, someone who was over the age of 65, there were a lot of people who didn't fall into any of those categories and just couldn't get coverage. And the county was their last resort. Now, luckily for you all, you live here in Ventura County, when your county does a pretty good job, um, so your, your county wasn't one of the ones I had to sue. <laughs> but a lot of other counties didn't, didn't do such a great job. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, um, I represented some plaintiffs in, in Fresno County, in the Central Valley, um, where their county would only provide coverage to people if they were uh, making less than $700 a month. Um, I represented a, a gentleman who was making about $800 a month. He, uh, he had epilepsy and he needed a medication that cost $1,200 a month. Uh, you don't need to be a mathematician to figure out that, that that's not going to work, right? Um, so luckily for him, we were, we were able to sue the county and, and get him some help, but, but this was really the state of affairs all over the state and all over the country, um, and that was sort of the pressure leading up that, that really led to needing a, a better solution to get people affordable access to health care. So in 2010, the world changed. We got the Affordable Care Act, um, and as the congresswoman said, it, it certainly isn't perfect, but it certainly expanded the options considerably. Um, so. For one thing, it made coverage more widely available. It allows states to expand Medicaid, which is our Medi-Cal here in California, to all low-income people, so you don't have to fit into one of those categories anymore. As long as your income is under the limit, you're eligible for coverage through Medi-Cal that's almost completely free. Um, and then it also got rid of that pre-existing condition uh, exclusion. So it's what's known as the guaranteed issue provision of the ACA and it requires private health insurance plans to sell insurance to just about everyone, even if they have pre-existing health conditions. There are some other things you've probably heard about. Um, Medi-Cal was also expanded to certain form of foster youth up to age 26, and most private plans are also required to cover young adults up to age 26 um, under their parents' insurance. 
So all these options together really expanded the coverage that was available to most people. The ACA also took on the affordability issues. So um, through the tax credits and the cost sharing reductions, uh, people can buy insurance through the health, place, the health marketplaces, which is our covered California here in California, and get help with the cost of care. Um, so that if you're lower income, you get that, those tax credits to help you uh, afford the coverage that you get. And in addition, the Affordable Care Act put limits on out-of-pocket costs. So you can only be required to pay a certain amount in terms of your deductibles, cost sharing, co-insurance, and your out-of-pocket maximum, once it reaches a certain amount, the plan has to pick up the rest. In addition, the Affordable Care Act tried to make coverage better quality. So it requires plans to cover essential health benefits. Most of the benefits that you need are not going to be covered under your plan. And that includes preventive services, which plans are required to cover without any cost sharing. So those of you who've taken your child to a well child visit, or you've gone to get a mammogram or a cancer screen, those services are all covered for free. In addition, plans have to meet a medical loss ratio, which means if they don't spend enough on your care and they're spending too much on their administrative costs, they have to give you a refund. Um, so they're really required to keep their eye on the bottom line and make sure they're, they're spending their money on your care, not on making a profit. And then, of course, the ACA also invested in the workplace, the, the workforce, the healthcare workforce, and in our safety net clinics, and brought a lot of jobs, healthcare jobs, um, to this country. And I think some of my colleagues will talk more about that in a few minutes. So, um, like I said, it's not perfect, but what we're seeing now uh, with the current proposals is that, you know, we've, as, as the Congresswoman said, the Republicans have had a long time to come up with an alternative to the ACA, but we haven't really seen much yet. This week they put out a few bullet points, but it's not a fully uh, fledged proposal yet that we can really talk about. So I just wanted to speak briefly about some of their talking points and, and what it could look like. Um, one of the biggest things is they're going to try to take away some of those expanded coverage options. So that they would take away the Medicaid expansion, that's our Medi-Cal expansion here in California, meaning we might go back to those days where you have to fit into a specific category if you're low income in order to get help from the state. They are also proposing to turn the Medicaid program into a black block grant or a per capita cap, and, and really what that means is um, they want the states to pay more for the cost of Medi-Cal and the federal government to pay less. Um, for those of us who lived in California for a while and have seen the budget shortfalls that we faced, we know that's likely to mean just more cuts to the program overall. They're also proposing to um, take away the guaranteed issue, those pre-existing condition exclusion protections, uh, they say instead maybe they'll put people into high risk pools or they'll give them some kind of health savings account. We don't know exactly what will, that will look like, but we know that those are two plans we tried before in the 90s and the early 2000s, and they didn't really work very well. Um, people didn't really get access to the care that they needed. Um, then as the congresswoman mentioned, they're talking about basing the tax credits on your age, not your income. So that everyone who's 30 years old will get the same amount of tax credit whether you're working and making a lot of money, or if you're unemployed and just trying to scrape by. And then finally, they have also talked about changing some of those provisions that enhance the quality of care. So taking away the essential health benefits protections and going back to the days when plans could just cover whichever benefits they felt like instead of the benefits that people actually need. Um, and taking away that medical loss ratio protection so that plans can focus on maximizing their profits instead of really investing in the care that they deliver to people. Um, we're very concerned about all of these things. My organization, the National Health Law Program, is, is working here in California and also at the national level in DC um, to try to fight those proposals. Um, but we certainly need the help of all of you. Um, so you know, keep up the phone calls that you're making. Keep sharing your stories about how the ACA has helped you. We really appreciate all that you're doing. Um, and thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. Great summary there. Thank you for coming tonight and inviting me to share a little bit. I'm here going to try to give you a little picture of what uh, the Affordable Care Act did in Ventura County and where we stand today as far as uh, those who are benefiting from the, from the program. So to explain just a real briefly background, uh, um, what we're responsible to county, the Human Services Agency, is dealing with the Medicaid program primarily. And so that's what... Uh, 
I'll focus in on, but the, the, the ACA itself has a whole plethora of range associated with healthcare. So you have the Covered California, which is the exchange programs, which is one segment. You have the private market, and then you have the Medicaid or Medi-Cal in California. So I'll go over those briefly and, and what, to, what has transpired for us. The state of California did expand Medicaid the Medi-Cal program were one of 31 states in the nation that expanded the program. So that, that's important to note that um, not all states did do that there. What that means is that individuals then could, based on their income, could be eligible for Medi-Cal. So the, the range associated with wages is that there's a demarcation of income that will make you eligible. Prior to the, the Affordable Care Act, it was a very complex formula of income and assets and various other categorical requirements in order to access health insurance. The Affordable Care Act took away that and did it based on income, and it's taxable income or your modified gross adjusted income or a tax household is now the criteria for eligibility into uh, insurance. What the expansion did was allow working parents and jobless parents to uh, actually go from 100% of the poverty level to 138% of the poverty level to be eligible. And it allowed single adults who did not have a dependent child or a dependent adult meeting criteria to earn 138% of poverty to also access health care. So that was a huge uh, expansion in allowing individuals to access uh, health care. And, and thank you again to Ventura County, but I would like to promote our health care system that uh, we do have a philosophy that will serve anyone that, that comes through our doors and we, we accommodate them the best possible way. So what does that mean now that these thresholds have been set and established uh, here in Ventura County? Prior to ACA, we had 119,000 individuals uh, receiving Medi-Cal benefits. Uh, throughout the last couple of years, the enrollment has increased to, to, the, to a number today, we're at 226,000 individuals that, that receive health benefits through the Medi-Cal program. So that's nearly a 100% increase associated with it. Uh, to give you a little demographics, about half about 100,000 are children, 0 to 19 years old. So it is a, a very heavy children's access program for, for health care. Um, the other, there's about 44,000 residents of Ventura County that are involved in the health care of Covenant California, the exchange. And so those that uh, are not eligible for Medi-Cal, meaning that they have income greater than 138%, but have income between 200 and 400%, are eligible for the exchange. And, and that's 44,000 individuals are enrolled into a commercial plan that has tax subsidies in order for them to afford uh, health care. Now, we can debate, and I'm not here to debate on the, on the health care plans, but there's a lot of improvement that, that could go into those as well. Um, just to give you I don't want to bore you with the uh, eligibility statistics Yeah, absolutely. So we do have a, and I was going to pull, I was looking for my staff on seniors. So we have individuals, we have about just under, just over 15,000 individuals that's 65 and older that, that receive Medi-Cal. And there's certain criteria because we do have the Medicare program as well. So, so there is some, some duality associated with that program, but those that, that find themselves the, the most indigent uh, would, would qualify for the Medicaid program there. In addition, we have in California, we have an in-home supportive services program, which helps seniors maintain their living and their health within their home. 
and um, that that program you have to be Medi-Cal eligible for in order to benefit from that. California is very progressive in that regard of saying it's better to take care of an individual within their home in order to prevent them from going into a facility which costs much more much more funds and, and money associated with it. But all that would be impacted relative to the thresholds associated with the, the Affordable Care Act and would send a ripple associated with other systems that, that would be impacted. In addition, it was very important for California and well with our, our healthcare system in general is that the expansion allowed us to do so with federal participation. And, and that's the, the, the risk of a block grant. Right now, up, up until this past year, the federal government in the expanded population paid 100% associated with the cost of that. The state now is gonna have to bear greater costs associated with that year over year up until 2020, which it would be at 90% for, for the state. So a block grant would then relieve the, the, the participation from the federal level, which will impact local communities very heavily on our obligation to take care of those that find themselves in need of health care services. So that gives us an overview, just real quickly, just to let you know in California, uh, we started a pre-ACA at uh, 8.6 million individuals on Medi-Cal, and that has grown to about 13.4 million statewide so it is a significant number that that would be impacted with any change that occurs so those are some of the statistics i'll get into the the details if you want later on on criteria associated with the individuals accessing health care thank you we really discuss it in those terms um, and I know we could discuss. I could discuss what it's like living with a kid with type one diabetes for days. Uh, let, suffice it to say that it's very, very difficult, and it's unending. It really is something that my son deals with throughout the day, throughout the night, and until there's a cure, he will for the rest of his life. Um, there, we've had several hospitalizations. Um, ICU visits. Um, even the flu gets more complicated when you have type one diabetes. And before the ACA, and we did have coverage, and because we maintained our coverage, and he was a minor, he did come under our coverage. But we were constantly fighting our insurance company for up to get matters covered. We had individual policies. Um, our height rates were very large annually. Our deductibles were very high. Separate deductibles for overall medical, for prescription drugs, for medical devices. Um, our worst year was 2013. We were routinely spending $30,000 plus for our medical. And those were checks we're writing out for people who want to know we don't qualify for any sort of coverage. We're not wealthy by any means. However, we don't qualify for any coverage, um, any subsidies for anything. And so these are checks that we have written out over the last uh, 10 years in particular. Our worst year was 2013. Our medical spending for that year exceeded $70,000. I guess the uh, lining in that was we did get to do a deduction <laughs> because it exceeded 7% of our income. Um, but quite honestly, we've had to dip into our retirement. We've had to dip into my son's college fund. Thank heavens the ACA came along when it did because we can't go on like that. I don't know a lot of families that can't go on with that sort of spending annually. Um, even under the ACA, uh, it's still expensive. Our, our medical spending exceeded $23,000 for the past year, uh, 2016. Those were checks that we actually wrote out. However, I could plan for it. I knew that we had coverage that I could rely upon and that I, I could budget very effectively going forward. Now suddenly, that's really been ripped out from under us because the reality is we're looking at an environment now in which there is no coverage for pre-existing conditions or, and these for the self-employed, I'm speaking specifically for self-employed people, for those who are lucky enough to get it from their employers, they don't face those same restrictions that those of us who are self-employed and forced to buy on the individual market. Um, the idea of a high-risk pool is something uh, 
that I reject completely as being effective coverage. My, my husband was under a high risk pool for a couple of years. Um, it's not meaningful coverage, especially for someone who has a disease like type 1 diabetes that's very expensive to maintain. Um, if, for instance, his insulin expenses alone, I called CDS, and um, with a higher deductible, I just wanted to know what our out-of-pockets could potentially be, and his insulin needs alone would exceed $1,200 a month. That doesn't include any sort of me um, medical coverage. It doesn't include his pump supplies that he has to reinsert into his body every three days. Um, and I would like to say that whoever named the Affordable Care Act affordable really needs to go back to marketing school because it's not affordable. <coughs> Health care in this country is so expensive for everybody. Like I said, I haven't been thrilled to spend $24,000 this year, or 2016. But like I said, it's something I know I can rely upon it, I can budget for it, and I can do what it takes to get, those, to get that money together for our family. Um, right now, it's the self-employed that are most vulnerable in these, well, I'm sorry, I say that, and of course it's people who receive Medicaid and everything else. I'm talking about people who are actually paying full ticket, though. It's the self-employed, and I'm sure you all know people in, who, in your neighborhood, in your families, who are self-employed. And again, it's not a political party. <laughs> it, it's just a, a reality in the economy, sometimes by choice, sometimes not by choice. And we need to be able to have accessible, meaningful health insurance coverage. Um, I know that right now, the individual markets are already being destabilized. These, these policies are supposed to be submitted to the state of California, I believe in the next six weeks, in March. How, how can they? There's no, they don't need, even insurance companies don't know what they're going to have to cover. And so, of course, they'd rather cover less, less than what they would need to. Um, and so it really is critical that we can talk about improving the Affordable Care Act. Hey, I've got a list of improvements we can make, starting by covering, having um, emergency care doctors covered under the policy. So I don't believe California has made an improvement on that. Um, just two years ago, my son um, was headed to the ICU. We had to get him down to the Children's Hospital. And they told us, if you can't get him here quick enough, pull over to your nearest emergency room, and, and we had to. And my son's laying there with two different lines in his arms and everything else, and I'm arguing with the ER doctor saying, you're not covered under our anthem policy. We're just trying to get down to Children's Hospital. You need to get us there. And having him inform me, don't worry, being DKA, when a diabetic has not enough insulin in their body, is one of the top 10 leading causes of death. And I can assure you that you will be covered for this visit. No American has to have this conversation in the emergency room. This intimately affects my family every other family that's out there. Health care is a human right, not a political issue. And, and there's only one risk pool. Americans. Americans, those are the people who need to be covered. One risk pool of over 300 million people. It shouldn't matter if you work for a large employer, a small employer, have a government employer, or a veteran. There's one group of insureds here, and we're all Americans. And I would really like to have a national conversation in which the political elements are toned down and we can have reasonable discussions, because I know other people